Howdy folks, welcome back to the podcast. Today, Katie and, and myself, we are going to be talking about our lies, myths, and misconceptions that Christian parents believe. Lies, myths, misconceptions. Lies, myths, misconceptions. Lies, myths. Before we jump into today's episode, though, I do want to thank you all for the ratings and the reviews we've gotten on iTunes. What a blessing that is. Not only to read your encouragement, the encouraging words that you say, but that helps our podcast reach more people, which helps us do more of what we love doing. And similarly, if you watch us on YouTube, when you subscribe, when you like, when you comment, if you share any of our episodes, that helps us grow, reach more people. And it helps us, like I said, do more of what we, we, of what we love to do. And Katie and I have aspirations to be creating a lot of content for years to come. And we're only able to do that because of how you guys view, view our videos. You listen to our podcast, you share it. And so we get to do what we want to do because you guys enable us to do that. So thank you so much. Yeah. It's a huge blessing to us. And that's all. That's it. So I guess we'll jump into the intro. But now that we're a family, well, I'm happy to be here today. You are? Yeah, Me I am. Too. Actually, it's a very happy day because it is Elisha's 33rd birthday, the wow. day that we are recording this. And he wanted to still record a podcast on the day of his birthday. So you guys are pretty special. Yeah, well, this is when we could get a babysitter. So it was the time to record the podcast also you spoiled me this morning for my birthday you got me a donut who gets a donut on their birthday anymore you know yeah we went all out got yeah. a donut Elijah can be kind of hard to celebrate for birthdays because he's you're not like the biggest birthday fan so like I want to make you feel special hmm. but not do something that I would like for me for you you know what I sure. mean sure and I want to get better at being good at celebrating things. I want to become a better celebrant because I like it's, I become, I don't want to be a grouch. You know, I want to oh, be somebody are. that people enjoy buying gifts for or celebrating. It's always made me uncomfortable and I've always tried to, have tried to avoid it since as long as I can remember. Like my birthday day is always like, oh, don't tell anybody, you know, like let's just get through this. And then people find out after the fact, like, no way we should have this, that, or the other. I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, well, you know, there's always next year, but you, you've become very creative and uh, thoughtful in how you, you bless me on my birthday. You find very special ways to make me feel special. So Good. I appreciate that. Are. Uh, yeah. And are you, do you know, it's crazy. Last time we were recording in here, you were like coming off of a borderline meltdown, but you're doing better. I'm sure everybody wants <laughs> okay. to know. <laughs> the update. Yeah. No, it was funny. I told Elisha, um, we got away a while ago from talking real time about how we were doing like in that exact moment emotionally. Yes. Uh, and I kind of went back to that last week. But it was funny because I was telling you on the way here, I think my thing is just Mondays. Mondays are just really big days. Yes. Um, because when I used to have work to do, that would just be the most important thing of the day. And so it'd be really easy to brush like either eating at home aside. We'll be like, oh, we'll just eat food out that day. You know, mommy has work that she's doing or I ditch the kids school that day or we wouldn't go outside or, you know, those other things. And now I value those three things so much that I just still do them. And then we mm. add in the work yes. of recording. And so it just makes the day really jam packed, but it, it's really just Mondays. And, and this week I was a lot more prepared for it. And, and after that, my week is like smooth sailing mm. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. I, I love the life that I get to live. So yeah, it was, I did melt down last Monday, but we are doing much better. Good. That's, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. It's funny because this episode in general is kind of real time. Uh, and that is because in celebration of my birthday, something that I do really enjoy doing on my birthday is getting together with two of really my longest standing friends. I think they both are my longest standing friends. One's your uncle, mm -hmm. uncle Wade, and then my friend Derek. And for the last, maybe, I don't know, 10 years, we've gotten together for our birthdays because all of our birthdays are within about two weeks of each other. And so we'll get together and do dinner. We've maybe missed a year here or there, but it's, it's, it's more or less a tradition. I'd, I'd say it's a tradition. It's definitely a tradition. It's a tradition. Yeah. And we did that last night. Uh, we went to dinner and then we had a bonfire and it was great. And I was struck by the conversation because 
I mean, I stay in touch. With, I'm good friends with these guys. I see them pretty regularly, but there's nothing like being able to have an uninterrupted, like three hour, four hour conversation around a campfire to really get caught up on each other's life. Yeah, there's over a dozen kids between us, so there's a lot going right. on. Yeah, exactly. If our families are all together. Yeah. It's, yeah, or you guys are getting together for like a brief amount of time, and then you have to go to work or back home to your families yes. or whatever. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but but talking about parenting, talking about family, and the necessity for having a big vision in order to maximize your time in the home, and I think uh, a misconception, we'll just jump right into it, is something that we've actually heard a lot in our Q&A polls, or kind of some, the, the, at least the sentiment's been communicated in various ways. And that is, um, you know, how do I find more contentment at home? I'm a big vision person. Or how do I get my spouse on board with being uh, involved in the household? They're a big vision person. They've got all sorts of dreams and aspirations, and and they don't see the value in doing stuff at home. And that can be a mother or a father, and, and they don't see the value of the home because, in air quotes, they're a big dreamer or they're a big vision person, or they're somebody that's driven and motivated. And you, you said something that was, I think, extremely profound when we, when we heard one of these questions and and we were going to do it on a Q and a, but then it went, that episode got long. And so we, we, we took it out, but I, the question was along those lines of how do I get my spouse on board with being more present in the home and investing in the home? Because they're a big vision person, they're a big dream person, and they don't see the value in it. Yeah, and this was a wife asking this question about her husband, because her husband's very ambitious and has a lot of goals and dreams. And it was just interesting how she phrased it, how I think a lot of people would phrase it, Mm. which is, he's a big vision person. How do I get him to see the value of the children? Yes. And um, the first thing I said when I read the question was, Well, he doesn't have a big vision. He's not a big vision person because the biggest vision that you could possibly have is a vision beyond your life ending. And that is your legacy. When you have a vision that pours into your children and you have a multi-generational vision, that is a big picture vision. Mm. It's not a big picture vision to think, oh my word, I could, I could accomplish so much in my 80 years of life here on earth. Yes. Yeah. Or if I, you know, put in the extra work or get the extra credentials, I can climb the ranks in this company or I can start this business and and scale it to this level, which those are all great things. But when you compare that in light of what happens in a home and a, in a a family, when you're developing multi-generational faithfulness and impact, that's going to be far longer lasting than your life. The greatest opportunity for that is in the home. I'm not saying you can't create multi-generational impact outside the home too with a company and you know in your local church and things like that but the best opportunity you have for creating multi-generational impact is starting in the home and we were talking about that last night and i was so blessed by like-minded christian men that truly see the value of the home and we were we were starting to talk about you know just the blessings of our wives and how it, it is it is kind of bizarre when you I'm sure many people can relate with this, somebody that you grew up with or somebody that you went to church with when you were younger and you felt like minded in you, sorry, you felt like minded with them. And then depending on who they married, that really determined like a a big part of their values in their future for the next, you know, for the rest of their life in a lot of ways, you know, so maybe you were like minded on a certain, you know, parenting or, 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 or family concept. And then depending on what their spouse felt about family, you see them 10 years later and you're like, wow, we don't really relate at all on this topic. And again, with these friends that I was with, we all relate on those topics largely in part because our wives have their hearts, you know, towards the home and they see the value in it. And it is kind of crazy when you start to hear the opposing narrative about what a mother once again, air quotes, sacrifices when she chooses to stay at home. And you're like, okay, so like walk me through that really quick. Like what is, what is she losing, you know, when she's not, when she's not working at home and it would, it would be so hard for me. It's, it's hard for me to imagine somebody presenting me with something that a woman's sacrificing that is of more value than the home pouring into her children. Does that make sense? Yeah, Pouring in yeah. to the next generation, being able to bring these kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to shape their souls, to actually have your your fingerprints on 
the next generation in an extremely practical and tangible way. You're like what salary, like give me, throw out a number, like what, what, what job and what salary or what commission are you getting that would replace that, you know, would replace the value in that. And once again, outside of money, what type of impact outside are like, are you having what, what nonprofit are you doing? You know, what like social work are you doing? What ministry work are you doing that you get to have multi-generational, like <clears throat> culture changing impact that's, that's beyond the home. And it really is inspirational when you think of what happens in, in the home. Yeah. And I think of that term impact, something that the devil loves to do. And he, he does this through culture often, uh, but is take some truth and use it to pit it against the ultimate truth, which is God's design for, for the world. Mm. And I think of that when it comes to impact and we think when we hear the world compare a woman's impact, for instance, we really are comparing this impact outside the home that seems very exciting and shiny and and powerful. And I'm not saying that you can't have those, those things. You can have both of these things. They aren't, they aren't, um, mutually exclusive, exclusive. but that is compared to doing laundry and diapers in the toddler years. Hmm. And it's very hard for us as humans to see, to value one. We have to force ourselves to really tell ourselves we need to value this, Hmm kind of martyrdom life that I'm living because it it's not super exciting and it is very mundane and it is very repetitive. But that's the wrong thing to be to be weighing on the scale, the impact you could be having maybe in women's ministry at your church versus the impact that you're having at home wiping spit up off your shoulder and breastfeeding. The impact is comparatively who are your children going to be when they are raised and when they are married and they marry someone and then they have children and they raise those children and those children multiply and they spread the gospel. Like that is the impact that we're comparing here. Hey, you guys, I just wanted to tell you real quick about my homeschooling course, Homeschooling the First Three Years. It's all about laying a foundation of joy and confidence and fun and simplified homeschool in your home. So if you're in a place where maybe you're considering homeschooling your kiddos in the next few years, then this course is for you. It's going to break down not only what we do for homeschool in our family and what we've done for the first three years in homeschool, but it's also going to show you exactly how that looks. Looks. So I'm going to take a camera around with me vlog style and show you how does it look to homeschool with a baby? How does it look to homeschool with a toddler? How does it look to homeschool multiple grades at one time? How do you navigate um, different learning tendencies? How do you navigate your learning style as a teacher? And how do you motivate children and get them to love learning? I love homeschooling my kids. One of my favorite things that I get to do with them each day. And it's something that I want you to love doing with your children as well well. So if you look down in the description box, you will be able to find a discount code where you can get a discount off of homeschool the first three years. And I really hope that it blesses your home. Yeah. And it doesn't, like you said, that multi-generational, it doesn't stop with a two-year-old. Yeah. And it goes even beyond what you just said in that individual's life. Cause I, in addition to that, we talk about this hospitality being an overflow from what from what you have in your home. Like, like you want to create bandwidth, excess bandwidth so that you can, so that you can pour into others Mm -hmm. because there probably are, uh, you know, young women at your church that are in a place of need where it's like, Hey, you can pour into that young lady's life. But I think the best place to do that is from the context of the home. (laughs) When Mm -hmm. you think about bringing that lady into your home and being able for her to being able for her and her being able to, to witness, to be present, as you are managing the home and pouring into her into that in that context is is so powerful and that's the same with the family in general when you think about having a home and a structure in a place where you know you're able to host you actually have abundance you have overflow because you are prioritizing uh the well-being of your children and of your marriage there's there's bandwidth there versus when it's all when your nine to five is spent out, there's very little bandwidth when you come back. You're like trying to pick up the pieces of just your home and pour pour into them. And yeah. so, yeah, I'm with you. Just the children themselves and the souls that they are able to impact is more than 
like what we, we could think to imagine on what that impact is. But then even while doing that, there is total potential and total, I think, um, yeah, space for that, that, out, that, that ministry that you've always pictured as being outside where, where you're like, oh, I need to go be speaking at this event or I need to be serving at this physical location. Uh, and, and so, <clears throat> boy, I tell you what, my throat is dry. I'm but, sorry. No, it's okay. Do you want some water? I'll get some in a second. Um, but I think when you, when you prioritize the home, that then f- that falls into place. Yeah. And, and I think we've had this conversation a lot. I think a lot of this conversation often centers around women and mothers and the home and all that. And I loved how this was phrased from a woman's perspective, asking about her husband specifically, yes. uh, because I think, I mean, you could speak to this, but I think it's just such a blessing. I think the world needs more leaders in the home. That's where our families are going to grow and have impact. And that's where politics are going to change. And that's when theology is going to um, be dispersed. Like the heavy lifting needs to be done by men, Mm. not just by mothers and the women in the home. And I feel like there's been a real revival around motherhood. Mm. Um, But the heavy lifting is often done by the men. The Lord created them to carry a lot of burden. And because of that, if, if a man just is viewing that, that burden that he's meant to carry, and I mean, burden is responsibility and in a good way is just outside in the workplace. And it's like, Hey, if I'm providing, I'm doing my part, then, then that puts either a lot of burden on the wife, or it's just, the impact is not going to be as great. It's, it's incredible when you look at statistically, like whether the mom takes the children to church or the father and the mother go to church or even the father taking the children to church. Um, I wish I had some of those statistics Mm -hmm. because it's, you know, triple, I believe if, if I'm remembering correctly, it's like triple the response of children wanting to carry on the faith if they see their father. Um, valuing that versus if it, they see their mother valuing that. Yeah. So it is very powerful. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Like you said, it, this, this conversation does seem to always fall on the, on, on the wife, you know, or on the mother and, and the role that she can play in the home. But I do think it is a common, uh, misstep of men to think that, okay, my role is just out providing in the workplace. And I think that is a part of our role is being out there in the workplace making it happen, providing for the family, obviously being the protector of our home, but then your presence in the home cannot go, it, 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 it can't be replaced. You need to have a presence in the home, not just physically, but spiritually and mentally and emotionally, you have to be engaged. And the opportunity you have as the head of, as the man, as the head of the home to set the overall culture of your family, the influence is like, it's hard to quantify Like you are the most influential influence in that home. Whether you, whether you abdicate that role you're, or not, you're still the most influential person. Your, your, your absence is going to be what influences the home or your presence can be what influences the home. And obviously it could be in a negative way or it can be in a positive way, but the potential that you have to be a positive influence in the culture of the home is so great. And that is literally what's building culture in your town and, and then in your state and in, the, in, the, in the country, you know, the world, it starts in the home. And I think about this often when I'm driving home and various things pop up in life that get you down, right? Like you hear something on the news or you, you just feel tired or whatever, you get a bill that you weren't expecting and you have an opportunity to either bring that into your home, that, that heaviness, that weight, that discouragement into your home and have your home be a home that's discouraged, that's oppressed, that's heavy, that's heavy laden, where there's not joy, there's not light, there's not lightheartedness. It's not this place of vibrancy that your kids are are, are being brought up in, because um, you do that all the time. And then I can come home and be the total the the rain cloud on the day, and and you are always sympathetic to you. It's like, oh I'm, boy, I'm sorry, you're you must be wiped. You you had a long day, but why don't you sit down? You know, I stay away from daddy. You know, he you know give him some space. He's tired out, and you're always you're always so thoughtful. But boy, what an opportunity to come home and actually be an energy giver to say, I want to bring joy home when I'm coming 
through the through the front door, not just a, a you know a, a furrowed brow and some pessimism or some negativity, and that really dictates the attitude of the home is what the father's bringing home and how he's engaging. Yeah, well, you are a joy when you come home. I mean, we all delight with you coming through the front door, and I feel like you're such a life giver. Uh, and usually, something's pretty bad has happened if you are feeling bummed out. <laughs> but I think of just in terms of this question that was posed with this woman's response to her husband's vision, it's like, what a beautiful thing. Like we need, we need our husbands to have vision for us. Mm. Like I think we could, as women, we're coming up with our own visions for our own home and our homemaking and stuff like that. And I think it's really important to just focus on what we can control and not try to control our spouse because the Lord has to do a work. But, uh, when it comes to this vision piece, I think a lot of us do look to our husbands for vision Yeah, and more than maybe we even realize it. Sure. And so I know I'm just so grateful with the vision that you have in our home and the brainstorming that we do and the dreaming that we do together and the vision that you have for the business and the vision you have for our children's lives. And I don't feel like you've written off anything, I guess, as just my jurisdiction. So Mm. you don't care. It's like, well, I don't know, like educate the kids and, and I'll talk to them when they're 18 years old, you know, like you're involved in that process and you have a vision for who you, who you want them to be and how you want them to be educated and, um, what fields, of interest you'd like to expose them to yes. and um, who you, who they're going to be marrying one day. Like you're speaking into our sons and our daughter's life right now as mm. little kids, casting that vision for them of marriage and of family mm. and that being a worthy thing to pursue. And I just think that's like oxygen to our home, mm. that vision that you come in with. And I think of that when it, you know, we're reading the old Testament right now, the younger kids and I, and it's just, the Lord just saying over and over, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you see in all of the, all of the, uh, what are all of the things? Genealogies. Genealogies. Thank you. Uh, a few women are mentioned here and there, but it's the heads of the households that are mentioned. And that's not because women are any less than, but it's just placing this responsibility on the heads of the household for leading the faith, for carrying on the faith, for casting that vision, for building the altars, for leading and in that way. And I think sometimes just, it doesn't have to be, you know, sitting down and doing family Bible times necessarily, just the perspective of this is worthwhile and I'm breathing life and vision into our home can can go so far. Yeah, I think that's so good that you say that, Katie, babe. And just the fact that you can realize that you're breathing life into the home. You've got that mm-hmm. capability. Not only, Actually, I wouldn't say you just have the capability and the ability. You've got the responsibility to breathe life in into the home. Obviously, you brought the physical life here into this world, and, and it is now your responsibility, your opportunity, your your obligation to, to nurture that, to steward those lives that you have in your home. And I love that my father and my father-in-law have given me a vision for the home. And so I think that even when early on, when I was starting a business, when I was trying to develop my professional capabilities, I would read business books, you know, Jim Collins, good to great, or I'd read, um, you know, how I built this, you know, I guess that's a more recent book, um, or whatever the, the business books. And I couldn't help but think of the structure of the home and, and how these people were talking about leadership. You think, man, the institution of the home is so worthy. And you think of the CEO of the, of the home or the CEO, you know, of a company, you're like, look how much influence they have on the company that they get to dictate the culture of this company. And, and people feel so valued when they work there and people are, uh, they're all aligned on the vision and the mission and they know where they're going so that when there's a customer that's upset, they know exactly how to handle it because they, they have a bigger why behind what they're doing. They don't get caught up in the weeds. And it's because of a CEO giving this vision and leading by example and being a servant leader and being all those things, right, that you read about in these business books and these leadership development books. And yet, where should we first apply that? The, the first place we should apply that is the home. And that is also the most powerful place that we can apply all of those principles with developing a vision, with developing a direction that we're taking our family in, a multi-generational uh, vision. That's a, you have a succession plan. You know, like you, you think of all the things that you th- that people that are starting a company think of. And, and it's so funny. I make this joke all the time and maybe I've already made it on the podcast. But when people talk about creating a business plan, 
most people would would know they're like yeah it's probably going to be pretty you want that to be detailed you want you, may, you might even get an excel you know you might get a, a spreadsheet and really start breaking down <clears throat> product development, what the cost is, how much you're going to need to sell it for, you know, have sales projections and, and you would break it all down. Like who's our target audience or target client? Um, and what are these positions that we're going to need to fill in order to execute this, this said, said product or company. And then when you think of, and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. A business plan. And then you, you go, okay, what's a, what's family planning? What's a family plan? And, and all people consider when they think of family planning is what, just like, birth control basically right like what's the frequency in which you're having these kiddos but when you think of family plan or family planning it should be in depth just like when or far more in depth than when you're considering a business plan because this is something that's going to uh it's going to impact generations there's going to be generational impact and you know we recently made a video on 100 things to be do or have as a family but talk about just like a basic exercise to start developing a family culture, a family vision, because you might not have this mission statement, stuff like that's hard to do, I think, to be like, what's yeah. the mission statement of the Voper family? We don't have that right now, but we do have a hundred things to be, do, or have, and that starts then shaping the culture and the direction of our home, because of course we want to be Christian. Of course we want to be God honoring. Of course we want to nurture our children and bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We want to disciple them in his way. But that also is going to look like something practical. Like that's, yeah. that, that, that's going to be us doing something as a family. And so you start creating that list and you get to 25 and it's really easy to, to run out of ideas. And the reason I think it's easy to get to like 20 or 25, because you can just throw out these big ideas. You say, well, we want our family to go on a missions trip and serve, you know, people in, in Ecuador. And you're like, wait, put that on the list. But of course you can't do that tomorrow. Right. So it's easy to kind of punt until sometime in the future. You say, man, we want to, you know, all serve at a soup kitchen sometime. You're like, okay, well, that's not really feasible this week. We're busy. You just kind of punt it. But then you get past number 25 or you get past number 50 and you have to start getting extremely practical Mm -hmm. where you're like, okay, we also want to, um, you know, memorize the book of Romans together. Well, let's start that today. You know, like let's start memorizing that. And all of a sudden you're creating a family culture by creating that list of 100 things to be, do or have. But I'm kind of digressing because we've talked about that. Before, but I do want to echo what you're saying. We have the ability and responsibility to breathe life into our home with our physical presence, with casting a vision for our home. You, we, I think we need to view ourselves, men, as the CEO, like, and as that person that is casting a vision, saying, "Hey, this is where we're going. This is the plan. This is the ideal. We're going to try to hit this, and then be the guy that when when it when you don't hit it 100 percent of the time, you measure progress and you say, "Hey, well, you know, we got we got we're getting closer. Let's re- realign and continue continue mission." Yeah, I think that any you mentioned su- a succession plan, and I think that that's just not a way that we think here in Western <clears throat> culture is in terms of succession because we're very individualized and think just, oh well you know, my son or my daughter is going to go off and live their life and I'm going to live my life. And we all just kind of have this very short term perspective, which that it isn't like that in other cultures. And it hasn't been like that in history up until this point. You know, when you think of the leaders and the people that you remember in history, they all had a goal, the goal of having a succession plan, you know, like kings, right? Mm. They wanted heirs. That was very important. And they were lame kings that just wanted to birth an heir and not take care of them or raise them yeah. and actually be able to have them be a healthy person to transfer their yeah, kingdom over to. Him. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But having an heir was a very valuable thing. Hmm. And it's not something that we really consider here in Western culture. And I think of that, um, going back to the Bible, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like there was this succession plan for the faith. Hmm. You know, Abraham has this son, Isaac, and he's got Ishmael. Now he's got all kinds of things going on. But he's he's wanting to raise up Isaac to be the father of many nations. That's right. And God has placed a value on this succession plan. Man's taken it and twisted it and distorted it. But there can be a lot of health in that. And I don't know why. I mean, I like don't recommend the movie The Godfather, but it was like one of the most profound movies I've ever seen. And just that perspective of, yeah, you're dealing with these mob bosses, but it was so inspirational to me how this father was raising up his sons, working with them, bringing them along with him in a unideal business. Yeah. But 
to one day preparing them to hand off this yep. business. There was a succession plan there because it was so big that like his vision was so big, it involved his children. Yes. And I think that that is such a cool thing piece that we miss. Yep. And when we think home, when we say home, we don't think anything that probably inspires a man. Hmm. And, but when you think succession and you think of these, yeah, I don't right. know, when you picture something like the Godfather, yes, it, I don't know. It just seems yeah. really cool all of a sudden, really big picture. Yeah. Cause you can picture handing off a business, right? And if you're able to have a family business, that's great, but not everybody is called to that. Obviously not everybody's going to have the, you know, I guess, the propensity to be a, an entrepreneur or to run a, run a business. So maybe they're in a profession where you're thinking, well, how do I, what's the succession here? You're thinking the, the mission we're on is the same as a family. Like the, like you said, the mob boss, they, it was very particular what the mission was that they were passing on to their kiddos. Once again, as the fathers, it is up to us to define what that mission is. Say, hey, we are God's children. We are advancing the kingdom. We are making his name known. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You are you are next in line. Like I'm I'm moving the line to here. This is where we got it to. I, I'm passing the baton off to you. You are gonna have unique gifts, you're gonna have unique strengths. You might even have a you know particular regional calling where you're called to a part of the world that I wasn't a part of, but it's the same mission. And now you are uh, you're succeeding me and you're going on and continuing the same mission. And then you can break that down to very practical things. It's like, well, what are you actually passing off? It's uh, the family culture of reading your Bible with the kids. It's like being the husband that's home at dinner and sitting at, at the head, being the husband that is opening the Proverbs in the evening, being the husband or, or the father that's wrestling with his kids. Like that's what you're passing on is, is you're teaching your kid how to change a tire and, and you're reading when you're memorizing scripture with them and you're praying with them when you put them to bed at night, you're passing that off and you're thinking, well, those are really like practical, simple things. You go, those are tactics of the mission that we're on right now is tactics yeah. that are a part of a bigger strategy. And yeah, well, the, is it nice to have something like a family company to be able to pass off or an organization where you're saying, Hey, I need to make sure you're prepared to take the CEO role. When I, when I step down, yeah, that's a very like tangible thing for us to picture, but each home is that each home has that they are their own organization or their own institution that you are then, of course, you're not passing your home on, to your children, they're going to then take on their own home, which is then you start seeing the the multiplication that's taking place, and you're and then you stop stop viewing children as an expense. What a lie that is! That children are expense versus an investment. You're thinking, no, I'm investing into my future wealth because you are creating wealth when you're pouring into your children. And I see that already with our kids. We have our five children, and I see them learning new things and becoming more and more equipped. And I start seeing my insufficiencies and then ways that they are comp, you know, compensating for my, I, I potentially see them compensating for my insufficiencies and being like, man, that's so cool that I have this vision to, you know, further the gospel, to make Christ's name famous, to spread his word, to, you know, to, to be a part of the great commission, that commission that we're given. Uh, and I see so many shortcomings in my personality and my lack of learning. And I see how Leon or Louie or Lawrence or Lucy they're going to be better in these areas and they're going to be filling in those gaps. That's fun for me to start seeing. And I think, wow, I'm investing and in, I'm investing into my wealth. Well, where like, Oh, what's my personal return. It's less about my personal return and the impact they're having for our, our King and who yeah. we're serving. And I think that's something that's really also helped put this in perspective is the fact that we are put here on earth to take dominion. I know that dominion theology has a lot of strings attached that you may or may not agree with as our listeners, but the whole perspective of we're advancing Christ's kingdom here on earth. That's why we were put here is to bring him glory and to advance his kingdom. We're supposed to steward uh, what we have been given. We're supposed to maximize the talents we have been given. We're supposed to spread his name. We are supposed to, we can do that financially by supporting things financially. We can do that um it's so many different ways. Yeah, and every, and every and everything we do, like that everything we do. we're doing. And so is I think that. That just really clarified the mission for me, I guess, with our children is more Christians on the earth, having more children, impacting more communities, making more money that's going to be used for the gospel instead of, you know, supporting all these terrible movements. That is, that's taking dominion mm. and that's stewarding. And that, I think a lot of us as Christians, maybe for, I don't know, for 
a few decades have kind of had this perspective of like, okay, let's take our kids and go to a hill and hide them and protect them and keep them, you know, instead of having this infiltration mindset, yeah. which is like go out and, and blossom and share the gospel and just be an example of what can happen when Christ does work. Yeah. I think there is a time for the sheltering, you know, for yeah, preparing, yeah. for equipping, for being extremely, having yes. a controlled environment, that bubble, so to speak, where you're training them, but you are training them for a mission that they're going to be going out and, and, executing yeah. you know on and it's a and it's a continuation of we get caught up in our own name and i think that's the whole thing we we kind of started with is you know they're being a big vision person it makes it hard to uh to be you know to see the value of the little things at home you know wrestling with your kids or family bible times whatever it may be um and our our mission it's one of the most liberating things is when you is when you realize I don't, I don't even know if this is the right way to say this, but the, the it's like my story didn't start when I was born and it's not going to end when I die. And that's not even the main story anyways. Right. Like mm -hmm. I'm a part of the, this ongoing story that started at the beginning of time. Right. And that God is, is writing and you start thinking of all the different people that he's used over the, the last, you know, over the thousands of years of this world being created. And then you think of Christ coming and ha that part of the story and then him saving people, you know, selecting people and saving them, saving them as his own, you know, his, his elect. And then us furthering his name and spreading his, his name and his glory across the face of the earth. And then you're like, wow, what a glorious story I get to be a part of. I'm here for a very short time. It's going to be a snippet. What is me doing my part in, in that, you know, in that narrative? Well, and it, and it probably, again, that might be a, that, that probably will be you excelling in a field, right? You should be excelling in a field, but it doesn't just, you, you, your story is not just, okay, when I'm born and then when I die, how do I get the most out of that? When you're thinking multi-generationally, when you're thinking about being a God, part of God's long-term narrative then you're thinking, boy, I, I am a part of something so much bigger than me. I want to steward my time here. It's not about cashing the check when I'm 85 and being like, see all that I accomplished. Cause it's going to be so, if you view it through that lens, then that's when you get like, well, boy, if I'm here, you know, if I'm here having a Bible time with my kids, I'm not making another deal or I'm not spending more time on my side hustle. or I'm not getting the, you know, the credentials to go advance in my career. Uh, cause all you're thinking about is your, your short little lifetime. But when you're thinking multi-generationally, when you're thinking about God's greater story, then you're like, oh, this is honestly the best thing I could do is be home with my kids right now. Yeah. I think that, uh, a lie that people believe is, I was just going to say ultimately, but you know, <laughs> is, uh, they pit ambition against the home and saying, well, if you're an ambitious person, then it's going to be very hard to invest in your home. But I just really don't see that is that is true you know that whole the whole adage or what is it like if you give something to adage. a busy person yeah. if you want something done give it to a busy person and i think of that if you want something accomplished on a big vision scale give it to a big vision person which is someone who like i think of both of our dads they accomplish so much with their lives they are very financially successful they are very they have huge communities they have big ministries but their first focus was their kids at home. They're 11 and they're 10 children yeah. and raising them to go out and then have influence yeah. in the community. And I just think that's so cool. They're just, um, the Lord is blessed and blessed and blessed on every level of their lives. And it hasn't been easy, but so many people look to them just from a worldly standpoint and be like, I want the success that you have monetarily yeah. or um, <clears throat> the respect that you have or you know the reputation that you have, but they did it backwards. I guess. That, according to the world. According to the yeah, world standards. Did, yes. They didn't go out and pursue all those things and have their home fall apart. Yes, well that is the ironic part about so many things here, you know, it's like, I always I know, used this to say, a, could be a big conversation. I always used to say, you know, you, I think you need to think big, but act small. Remember that little yeah, term yeah. I coined? I, that was um, yours. As far as I know. I thought that whole time, every time you said that, you got that from someone else. No, I said, that is think, so good. Think big, but act small. And so put that on a t-shirt, the, the vision, you do need to have a big vision, but then obviously realizing, oh, that big vision should then be the impetus for me getting up tomorrow morning when my alarm goes off, drinking a glass of water, mm -hmm. reading my Bible, praying with the kids, you know, when they get up, whatever you start breaking that down to a very yeah. practical, tangible to-do list. Uh, 
but I think of my dad as something that he's said for years when you, when you're in the process of raising children, he goes, you got to keep your world really small. I think a lot of people could misinterpret that as being like, you need to keep your vision small. You need to keep your, you need to keep your dreams small. You need to, you know, you know, quiet down on those ambitions, you know, just kind of like set your expectations a little bit lower. That's not at all what he's saying. He's saying, you got to keep like your practical, physical, uh, actions right now, your, your, your tactics, keep that as small as you can right now. Like don't overextend your capacity or your bandwidth because the best use of that is within your home right now. So when he's saying, keep your world small, he's really saying like, Hey, st focus right now on the home. Like that's your, that's your world right now. The impact, the vision, the dream, that's far greater than those four, four walls. But right now your world is that, and the impact's going to be greater. And I think of how often we, you, there's throwaway terms. I feel like the people will be like, Hey, well, maybe you just need to lower your expectation or you're being too hard on yourself or, you know, you need to find, just be content with, with where you're at. And there's a lot of negative connotations with, with those things. And I don't think that, you know, the antithesis of contentment is ambition. Obviously it's discontentment, mm -hmm. but ambition you know, uh, especially when it's godly ambition is a good thing. And having ideals, having goals for your home, for your life is a, is a good thing according to God's hierarchy of value, like not neglecting the home, not neglecting these things, actually making those first and foremost <clears throat> and having your ideals and your dreams be submitted to those, to those priorities. And then instead of getting discouraged, cause you, you're like, man, I wanted to be making this much money when I was this age and instead it's tough. I got to put my time into my, put time into the kids and into my marriage. And you say, well, you know, it's easy to be like, that stuff doesn't matter. You say that I just need to lower my expectations in that part of my life. That stuff doesn't matter. You're like, well, no, that stuff still matters. You know, like it's mm -hmm. so funny when people are like, you know, money doesn't matter. You're like, well, like tell that to the government that's requiring your taxes, you know, like, like, yeah, like, like just, just tell that to the something. grocery store. That's like, you know, providing your food for you. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, of course this matters. Like, well, and also like just, that's a myth too, that like money is just <clears throat> evil. And if you have less of it, you're more godly. Yeah. Like, you know, when you were just listening to NPR about this, was he even a Christian? He's just some wealthy guy who was just. Okay. Why did you just tell everybody that I listened to NPR? <laughs> it's no. interesting. I will say this. I've got fond associations with NPR. I grew up listening to that. Obviously, it's always been liberal. It's gotten more so, you know, over the last Yeah, but it's interesting to hear what oh, people are thinking. And I will say this. NPR does such a phenomenal job with their production quality. It's I, I still love their programming. So much of the messaging and, and what they talk about is... But what, were, what was the guy that you were talking about? Yeah, Leonard Leo. Yeah, Leonard Leo. Yeah, the guy's he's, awesome. They hate him. Like NPR yeah. does not like this guy. He's a he's a Catholic influencer basically that's been like the most influential man in the country. Like he's determined the last four, I think, conservative Supreme Court justices. And you're like, oh well, I'm grateful for that guy. <laughs> yeah, like and, and that's the thing. It's like that's a that's a big picture vision. Like yes. we want these leaders, these Christian leaders, like we as Christians don't have to curl up and die and hide from the world. Like yeah. there are people that are impacting it Yeah. In, in dramatic, like seismic shift kinds of ways. Yes. Boy, we got on some tangents here, Katie, babe. And we only made it through like two of the lies, myths and misconceptions oh, we were really? going to talk about. Here's the deal. Okay. It's, we got to get the baby. I know, we have you to need go. a nurse in yeah, like I do need a 10 nurse minutes. Time. We got to wrap this thing up. We, we got a late start today too, because our YouTube videos went kind of long. Um, yeah, <laughs> really long. True. Anyways, maybe uh, we'll have to. This will be. Maybe we'll do a part two on this one. Yeah, something like that. Anyways, I can't remember what we were saying last time, but we just need to end it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Folks, thank you all so much. I feel like we left this conversation very half baked and half thought out. We'd but, be curious. You guys can finish the conversation in the comments or participate, and then maybe we'll come back, and share some more. Love it. Okay. Talk to you next week. Bye bye. Bye.